just a few seconds. I see a growing list of participants. Okay, so um, this week I want to use what we've um, done for hyperbolic surfaces to springboard towards some um, results that apply to more general Lie groups. And this will lead us in several directions. It will allow us to formulate the what's called the how more theorem about ergodic actions of simple groups and more generally their unitary representations. Um, it will allow us to formulate uh, Ratner's theorem and give the proof of, um, of the Oppenheim conjecture, assuming the more general statement. And uh, it will even allow us to look at uh, uh, geometric flows and er an ergodic theory on spaces beyond surfaces and even beyond homogeneous spaces. I'll give a brief sketch of how these ideas apply, for example, to Teichmuller space. Okay, so let's begin that program. So um, let me first formulate the theorem we're going to sketch the proof of and then um, and then we'll prove it for SL2R to see the main ideas. So um, let's let um, Let's let G be uh, a Lie group to start out with, just quite generally. And I'll remind you that a, a unitary representation is specified get, by giving a Hilbert space B, and then a map from the Lie group continuously into the unitary operators H. And I'm going to say that this representation is ergodic uh, if um, there are no non-zero invariant vectors. Which means that it does not contain, uh, does not contain among, among its irreducible components the trivial representation. Uh, an invariant vector is one just that such that uh, g dot f is equal to f. It's uh, fixed by all of the elements in the group. And uh, we'll say it's mixing if, um, as usual, uh, for all f and b, the inner product between g and f and f goes to 0, and g n goes to infinity and g. Now, of course, there are lots of possibilities for this vector space V. Uh, this, oh, sorry, this should have been U of V for this uh, Hilbert space V. So, for example, you can take V to be L2 of G. G has a natural par measure on it, and um, it acts, say, on the right. And this is called the regular representation of G. Notice that if G is non-compact, this space has infinite measure. Doesn't matter, still gives a nice Hilbert space. Um, but if you like finite measure, you might want to take V equal to L2 of X mu, where this is some probability space. And we have some map from G into the measurable automorphisms of X mu. That's the setting for the ergodic theory of the action of G. And of course, it's even better in this case to get rid of the constant functions. So if we get rid of the constant functions, then this definition of ergodic coincides with the usual definition of G acting ergodically on X, because it says the only invariant functions are the constants. So once you get rid of them, there's no invariant vectors. And, and this becomes the usual definition of mixing. So these, this terminology is just is based on the observation that for B equals L to naught, the notions of ergodic and mixing really depend only on the representation. And uh, finally, 
one of the nicest examples is we take V to be, um, let's say, L20 of gamma bar G, where gamma is elapsed. Um, then this space has finite measure, and it's an instance of this uh, first example here. Um, now, what can we say about the action of G on G mod gamma? <laughs> well, th this is a homogeneous space for G. G acts transitively. So the only G invariant functions are the constants, but we got rid of the constants. So this is, this is of course, this is always ergodic. as far as the whole action of G is concerned. Okay, so that's a kind of trivial case of ergodicity where the, the whole space is just one orbit under the action of the group. Nevertheless, this turns out to be interesting if ergodicity of G implies ergodicity of some of its subgroups. And that is what the how mohr theorem states. So to state, let me state the theorem. And I'll state it in slightly less than the greatest possible generality. I'll state it for simple Lie groups. So let G be a simple Lie group. Then any ergodic uh, unitary representation of G is also mixing. Now, remember, mixing is a is a pretty robust um, notion. If G mixes then of course, any subgroup contained in G also makes sense. This property just passes to closed subgroups of G. So here's a corollary of this how mohr theorem that says ergodicity implies mixing. Um, so as a corollary, um, let's prove a theorem that we've already proved once and see that it's a special instance of this. So let G equal SO2R, containing G of lattice and T1 of X be gamma mod G, uh, where X of course is the quotient surface, um, then uh, the geodesic and horror cycle flows on uh, T1 X are mixing. And in fact, let's just formulate a corollary that's stronger than this for any closed uh, uh, H contained in G, a simple Lie group, and uh, not compact, uh, the action of H on gamma mod G is ergodic mixing. Okay, so how does that follow from the Hal Moore theorem? Very simply, as we just mentioned, if the action of G on L naught of gamma mod G is always mixing, uh, always ergodic by transitivity, and, uh, and then mixing passes to subgroups. So if you have a closed subgroup, the action is mixing. But why is it ergodic? It's ergodic because uh, this, I assume this group was not compact. So you can take H in here tending to infinity. And so H can't have any invariant vectors because if it did, that would violate this fact that H and F, F tends to zero for all vectors in the Hilbert space. So by the way, if we drop the assumption that H is non-compact, we allow compact groups to act on G mod gamma, 
they're still mixing. They're mixing vacuously because in a compact group, there is no sequence that tends to infinity, but they're never ergodic. They're not ergodic because if you have a compact group, then gamma mod g mod k is a perfectly reasonable Hausdorff space and the continuous functions on this space, which forms some big algebra, uh, give you plenty of k invariant functions on g mod gamma. Um, in any case, as we've seen uh, already uh, in great detail, um, this corollary implies this one because the geodesic and horizontal flows correspond to the cases H is A and H is N as subgroups of uh, SL2. So the help more theorem is a nice generalization of the action of, uh, of the geometric theory of flows on um, hyperbolic surfaces. It also changes our perspective on that theorem because even in the case where G is SL2R, this is a significantly stronger theorem because it says any unitary representation of G has this good property. This representation doesn't even have to come from a measure space. It says that the fact that SL2R is acting on the unit tangent bundle is relatively insignificant. Whenever SL2R acts on something, ergodicity implies mixing. And we'll see an instance of that uh, shortly. Now, the next thing I should explain is, um, is what a simple group is. So this is always It's nice if possible in these theorems to try to avoid to having to do some sort of general structure theory for Lie groups. And I will do that by, for example, focusing on specific simple groups rather than the general theory. Um, but let me say right away what the definition is. So the definition is we say G is simple if, and then there's, there's a main condition, which is that, which sounds like simplicity of an ordinary group, which is that uh, for any closed normal subgroup of uh, N of G naught dimension of N greater than zero, this implies n is equal to g naught. Um, and here, what is g naught? Your group might in principle be disconnected. So if your group has several components, there's the component that contains the identity, and that's what we call g naught. So this is the identity component. So that's, that's what you would think is the full definition of simple, but there's a little bit more nuance here. Um, the second condition is that G mod G naught is finite. So for example, you could take a Lie group and just take its product with some very complicated discrete group, and that would still satisfy condition one because it wouldn't change G naught. Um, so when we discuss simple groups, generally, there's some tacit assumptions about the group being very close to its connected component of the identity. That's what this says. And then there's a third assumption, which rules out, for example, abelian lead groups. It says that the center of G, that is the elements that commute with everything, the center of G, um, or maybe I should say the center of G naught, rather, uh, is finite. Okay, so the usual way people think about simple Lie groups is not in terms of this definition, it's in terms of examples. So some examples that are simple are SLNR, for n greater than or equal to two, uh, the group uh, SON of rotations, this nice compact group for n greater than or equal to three, uh, the, and the 
isometries of hyperbolic space, SON1, for n greater than or equal to 2. Um, and more generally, most orthogonal groups of the form SOPQ, and many others, the symplectic groups, and so on. Um, but what are some examples of groups that are not simple? So not simple. First, there's the group SO2. The group of rotations is isomorphic to the circle, and it's equal to its own center. It has a positive dimensional center. And abelian groups of positive dimension are not considered to be simple Lie groups. Similarly, SO11, which is basically isomorphic to R star, is not simple. Um, another group that's not simple, you might think should be, is GLNR. Why is GLNR not simple? What would be an example of a normal subgroup of GLNR? Uh, SLNR? Yes, right. <laughs> so GLNR has this famous map called the determinant, which sends it to the real line. So having a homomorphism to a non-trivial Lie group gives you an interesting normal subgroup. So this is not simple because of the fact that it contains normally the group SLNR. So you have to get rid of these extra factors. This is actually what's called a reductive group. And there are many settings where one can use reductive in place of simple, but this is not one of them. And finally, one strange example that one should know about is this. So what's the fundamental group of SL2R as an abstract group? Who can tell me this? Z? Yes. And, and why is it Z? Uh, just because it's the unit tangent bundle to the hyperbolic plane. Great, right. So it's so it's so topologically it's the circle across the hyperbolic plane. Another way to say that is that this group retracts onto its maximal compact subgroup, which is SO2. So this is isomorphic to pi one of SO2, which is of course pi one of the circle, which is Z. And so this is a, it's a pretty weird example of a simple group with an infinite fundamental group. Most of the time, the fundamental group is not infinite. For example, for SON, it, will, uh, it, it looks a lot like RPN. The fundamental group will be Z mod 2. But for SL2R, the fundamental group is really big, which means that there's a covering space, SL2R tilde, which is simply connected. You can take the universal cover and the kernel of the map from the universal cover down to the Lie group will be a copy of Z. And that copy of Z is, lies at the center of this group. So this group is not an example of a simple group. That's one of the reasons, one of these examples where this uh, slightly strange looking assumption might come into play. Uh, okay, so that's the, just a thorough definition of what the helm moore theorem is about. And I should also mention that there's a version of this theorem for semi-simple groups. It just it requires a slightly stronger condition than ergodicity of uh, G. If you think of G as a product of groups, then each factor in the product has to be ergodic. And we'll content ourselves with this version because these are the groups We'll be most interested in. In fact, what we'll mostly be interested in is, is this, and uh, and possibly possibly this. Okay. So, what I want to do now, as I mentioned, the Hal Moore theorem is already interesting for SL2R, and I want to give you the idea of how it can be proved. Um, in that case, um, so we'll be reproving this theorem, but by generalizing it. And so let's do the proof for SL2R, this G. And what we're going to do is we're going to use the method of double cosets. This 
was the method that we introduced to prove Hedlund's theorem on minimality of the uh, horocycle flow on a compact surface. And I want to show that this, the this method is a recurrent theme in this uh, kind of ergodic theorem. Okay, so let me formulate a theorem. Uh, so this theorem will have three parts. It's about SL2R. So inside of SL2R, we have the subgroups A and N. And it says that any continuous uh, map P from N mod G mod N to R is constant on A. Now, what do I mean by that? Really, you should think of phi as a map from G to R with the property that phi of G is the same as phi of N1, G, N2 for any N1 and N2 that lie in the, in the horror cycle group or the parabolic group N. And to say it's constant on A just means that this map is constant on, on A when regarded as a map on G. So, it, you know, technically you could say it's constant on N uh, mod A mod N. <laughs> this is a subset of N mod G mod N. Um, so from invariance on the right and left under N, we automatically get uh, that it's constant on A. And then there's a similar theorem that says any continuous map phi from A mod G mod A to R is constant on N. And then there's a third theorem that says any continuous map from AN mod G mod AN to R is constant on all of G. Okay, so these theorems are just topological theorems about the shape of the Lie group T. Um, let me just remind you uh, how they're proved. We, we came very close to proving all three of these theorems when we analyzed these double coset spaces. They're easier than that analysis. So let's do theorem one first. So remember that there's an isomorphism between G mod N and R2 or really R2 modulo plus or minus one, modulo the action of uh, sending B to minus B. And the way this works is we is that we less that G equals SL2R, we let this, this acts linearly on R2. Well, it's not quite SL2R, but if it were SL2R, it would act linearly on, two, two, on uh, R2. And what's N? N is these matrices of the form 1 star 0, 1. It's the stabilizer of the vector 1, 0. So it's the stabilizer of 1, 0. And so this quotient space is R2. And uh, there's a map from, from G to this space. And the identity element doesn't go to the origin. Sorry, the origin should be omitted here. The identity map doesn't go to the origin. It goes to this vector 1, 0, the identity element to G. Now, what does A go to under this map? A is the matrices of the form A0, 0, A inverse. And when you apply those to the vector 1, 0, you get, of course, uh, A0. So A goes to the x-axis. So the x-axis is the image of A. So the image of N is this one point. The image of AN is, is the x-axis. And now what are the orbits of N? Well, we analyzed this before. The orbits of N consist of single points on the x-axis, because this shearing transformation fixes points on the x-axis, and then it's constant on uh, its, the other n orbits are the horizontal line. line. So this is n dot xy, if we pick any point xy with y not equal to zero. So the n orbits are the horizontal lines and the points on the x-axis. Now, what is a function on n mod g mod n? 
it's a function on g mod n that's constant on the n orbits. So phi gives you a function that's constant on the lines uh, where y is not equal to zero. So phi gives a map from g mod n to r, which is constant on the lines of the form y equals y naught, not equal to zero. But this implies, of course, that it's constant on the line y is equal to zero, because it's continuous also. And this line corresponds to A. So the, the important point here is that the function was not forced to be constant on, on A. These are different points in the quotient space, but the fact that we assumed it was continuous forced it to be constant on those many different points in this uh, double coset space. So that's the proof of one. The proof of two is even easier. So if we look in the space A mod G mod A, let's think of this geometrically. This is the space of pairs of geodesics. It's the moduli space of pairs of geodesics in the hyperbolic plane. And what does n correspond to? n corresponds to two things. The non-zero elements of n correspond to the geodesics that are asymptotic in forward time. Because if we take our standard vertical geodesic and we apply translation by n, we just get another geodesic that's asymptotic to it at the point of infinity. This is the non-zero elements of n. So this is n minus the identity. And then, of course, the identity corresponds to the case of, of two geodesics that are equal. So the point is that if you have a function that's constant, that's uh, on g mod a, the space of geodesics that's constant under the right action of A, it's constant on all of N minus the identity because of the fact that this subgroup corresponds to just one point in the quotient space. So this is actually much easier than case one. N star gives you a single point here. So a function that's invariant under A on both sides has to be constant on N star. And of course, once it's constant on n star, by continuity, it's also equal to the same constant at the identity. So phi restricted to n star is constant by a cross a invariance. And, uh, and then phi restricted to n is constant by continuity. Okay, and finally, case three, this is really super easy. So what are we discussing in case three? What's the quotient space G mod AN? AN is the stabilizer of the point at infinity. So G mod AN is the circle. So phi is a map from the circle at infinity into um, the real line, continuous. And we can think of this as r hat, if we want, the real line with infinity adjoined. And it's invariant under the action of an. Well, how does an act on the real line? It's the map of the form x goes to ax plus b, where a is positive. In particular, an acts transitively on the real line. So of course, since b is invariant under this group, that's this left action of an, phi is constant on the real line. And the real line is dense in the circle in r hat, and therefore it's constant everywhere. It's constant on the whole circle. And that means that it's constant period on this quotient space, which means it's constant on g. Okay, so, so r is a single an orbit. And once you have a dense a n orbit, it applies phi as constant everywhere. So it's a single a n orbit and it's dense, this implies phi as constant. 
Okay. So this is a little lemma from the theory of double cosets. And now let's use this to prove a theorem about SL2R and unitary representations. Okay, so we've seen that uh, the hypothesis we wanna work with for unitary representations, uh, ergodicity, uh, has to do with invariant vectors. So it's useful to know what you can say about invariant vectors. So here's a theorem about the way invariant vectors work for SL2R. So let F and D be uh, uh, a vector uh, and uh, rho from G, which is SL2R, or mod plus or minus the identity to, um, to the unitary phi, a unitary representation. Then the following are equivalent. First, F is an invariant. Second, F is a invariant. And third, F is G invariant. So in other words, once you have a vector that's invariant under one of these three groups, it's invariant under all of them, because the final conclusion is that it's invariant under everything in G. So that's pretty powerful. It sort of says, if the horocycle flow or the geodesic flow are ergodic, then the whole group acts ergodically. And it slightly strengthens that because it says the F invariant vectors are the same. Okay, so what's the proof? Proof is based on the following very important idea, which is you have this infinite dimensional Hilbert space. It seems very impenetrable, but then you have the inner product. And you can use the inner product to, to produce functions on G. And the key function to study here is we study the function phi of G, which is the real part of the inner product between G, F, and F. And let's normalize so that the norm of F in L2 is equal to 1. So what we're doing is we're taking our vector F, which is length 1. We're applying a transformation to it that preserves length. And then we're taking their inner product. And so this length here is the, is the value of this inner product. So what you'll notice is that the only way you can have equality in the Cauchy-Schwartz, the only way this inner product can come out to be one is when GF is equal to F, when the two vectors are parallel. So what we see is that GF equals F if and only if P of G is equal to one. Also, since G varies continuously in the space of unitary operators, GF also moves continuously, and so the inner product varies continuously. So this function is continuous, and just for the sake of orientation, we note that it's bounded by one everywhere. But the most important thing is it detects when F is invariant under the element G. And now comes the beautiful fact. Let's do case one. Suppose F is an invariant then what can we say about this function phi? Well, let's suppose we look at, suppose F is N invariant, and we look at N, G, N prime, F, F. So I'm going to take G, and I'm going to multiply it on the right and the left by N. And I want to see how this function changes. Well, remember that this function, f, this vector f by assumption is invariant under the elements of n. So this doesn't change f. On the other hand, n is unitary, so I can move it over to the other side here. So this is the same as g n prime f and inverse f. 
And since neither of these elements of n move f, this is the same as gf f. And now the proof is almost over. <laughs> because you see, what we just proved is that when f is n invariant, this function phi is not just a function on g. It's actually a function that's on, on the double cosets of n, because it's invariant under multiplication on the right and left by elements of n. So V is a, descends to a map from n mod g mod n to the interval minus 1, 1. And, well, let's see what our theorem tells us. If we have such a map and it's continuous, then it must be constant on A. Now, if it's constant on A, what's its value? Well, there's one point of A where you can evaluate it, namely the identity. And at the identity, it comes out to be one because the norm of F is one. So by this double coset theorem one, this implies F is A invariant because uh, phi of F, phi of A is equal to one for all elements of A. Okay, so that's the purpose of this theorem is you build this function phi and it's automatically invariant on the right and left for whatever group you already know fixes F. And then you get that F is fixed by this additional group um, that arises from the continuity hypothesis. So, so that proves that one implies two. Well, exactly the same argument says that if we take an A invariant vector, then this function phi of G actually lives on A mod G mod A. And therefore it's constant on N, so it's equal to one on N, and that applies F as N invariant. Okay, now, so what we see is that one and two uh, say that if F is N invariant, then it's A invariant and vice versa. So under either of these hypotheses, we get that F is A N invariant. But once F is A N invariant, we can apply theorem three because phi then becomes a function on this double coset space. And we just show that those functions are constant on all of G. And so that implies that F is G invariant. Okay, so this is a, this is sort of a, the, uh, fundamental case of the applications of this kind of double coset theory to uh, unitary representations. It allows us to promote invariance under a small group to invariance under a large group. Okay. So now let's proceed to the proof that um, of our main theorem. So let me state it again. So the theorem is if SL2R equals G ergodic on V implies uh, the, uh, it is mixing. Okay. So what does this statement tell us? It, we're assuming that we have ergodicity on, uh, on V. So that means there are no G invariant vectors, except for the zero. But if we had an N invariant vector, it would be G invariant. So there must be no N invariant vectors either. So this little lemma says, since G is ergodic, so is F. So that's great because the air conditioning of G is kind of obvious in many settings. And now we see it automatically gives you air conditioning of the horocycle flow. But now we can use von Neumann's theorem. Remember, von Neumann's ergodic theorem, again, it's really a theorem about unitary operators. It's not a theorem about measure spaces. It says if you have an ergodic action, that is, if you have no n invariant vectors, then if you take any vector and average it over n, it tends to zero. 
So but by a Neumann's theorem, if we let SS of F to be the average over an interval in this group N, which is isomorphic to the real line, say from N minus S to N plus S of uh, the value of, uh, of N, N F, um, then this tends to zero as uh, S goes to infinity. So we take an interval from minus S to S in this group, we move F around by it, take its average, that converges to zero. Um, on the other hand, we also know that SF is approximately equal to F when, when S is small. And now we can use our, the famous Hopf argument, step two of the famous Hopf argument, to prove that A is mixing. So this implies A is mixing by the usual argument. So I'm almost loath to repeat it, but I will. So the usual argument is this. You take the geodesic flow, you apply it to a function f, and you pair it with f again. Now that's almost the same as pairing it with a small average of x, of f, where s is small. But now we can move the at to the other side, and uh, or we can move the ss to the other side, and then we get that this is ss at f. F. And then we use the interaction between the horse cycle flow and the geodesic flow to convert this to an average over um, e to the ts of f, a much longer average of f than what we started with. We move the at over to the other side, and we get s e t s f at inverse f. And the absolute value of this, this vector remains a constant length, and this guy tends to zero as t goes to infinity because of uh, the Neumann's ergodic theorem. So this goes to zero, this stays bounded, and so this whole thing goes to zero, and that's mixing of it. And finally, how do we complete the proof? Well, you'll remember how we did this um, in the case of, of, of a surface. To finish the proof, we now want to show that G is mixing. So that if you go to infinity in G, you get um, convergence to zero. And we already know that's true in A. And to finesse the final end of the proof, we just use the fact that G is equal to KAK. So basically, if G goes to infinity in the group capital G, then it can be factored that up to compact factors, it's going to infinity in A. And uh, as we saw before, that's more than enough to conclude that, uh, that from mixing of A, that we have mixing of G. So this implies G is mixing. Okay, so now we've completed the proof of mixing of the horse cycle flow and the geodesic flow, and it all fits in this one little paragraph here. <laughs> Okay, so that's, that's the abstract pr perspective on the mixing of SL2R. Are there any questions on this argument? Okay, I have a question. What is it good for? Uh, where are some unitary representations of SL2R that aren't just the usual action from for a sur surface group? So I'm going to give you one application that I'm going to sketch, but it's kind of startling to my mind how powerful this theorem is. Um, so here's, a, here's an application. It's an application to Teichmuller theory. Application to Heidmiller theory.
And let me just state the theorem, and then I'll try to explain it. So the theorem is the Tyke Miller geodesic flow on Q1 of Mg is mixing. Okay, so what is the type Miller geodesic flow? What is the associated measure? What does mixing mean? Um, and what does it have to do with this theorem about SL2R? Uh, so let me start by explaining a little bit what the terminology is here. So first, Mg is the moduli space of Riemann surfaces of genus G. And we discussed this a little bit before. It can be described, there's a space of marked Riemann surfaces called Teichmuller space. And it can be described by taking Teichmuller space and taking the quotient by the action of the mapping class group of a surface of genus G. Uh, but in any case, there's one point here for each Riemann surface X. Now, we discussed how to construct a, all the Riemann surfaces in moduli space using pairs of pants. That was sort of the hyperbolic perspective. But what we want to address today is what is the complex perspective on moduli space. After all, Riemann surfaces are complex manifolds, so their moduli space should also be a complex manifold or orbifold at least. Uh, in particular, it should have a tangent space and a cotangent space, and these should be complex vector spaces. So it turns out that the uh, cotangent space at a given point x to moduli space with suitable interpretations at orbifold points is naturally identified with q of x, which is the vector space of holomorphic quadratic differentials on x. In other words, it's the set of objects q, which in local coordinates look like q of z, dz squared, and q is holomorphic. And this space of quadratic differentials is not really mysterious. In fact, it's very concrete. So let me just give you a little background or orientation regarding quadratic differentials. So uh, the first thing is there's a more familiar space, I think, called omega of x. This is the space of holomorphic one forms or linear differentials on x. And these are locally look like omega of z, dz. And uh, the dimension of this space is equal to the genus of x. It's, uh, in fact, that's a, one of the definitions of the genus of a Riemann surface. And for example, when X is the complex plane module lattice, so it's a Riemann surface of genus one, you can just take the form DZ on the plane, it's invariant under translation, so it descends to give a holomorphic one form on X. And then that's the only holomorphic one form up to scale. Okay, now, some of the quadratic differentials come from holomorphic one forms. Because if you take a, a holomorphic one form and you square it, or you multiply two of them, omega one, omega two, this is always a quadratic differential on X. So there's lots of quadratic differentials, but they don't, in, for high genus, they don't all come in this way. Um, and the dimension of this space, turns out to be 3t minus 3. This is over c. And you'll recall that when we have a surface of genus 2, we also did a calculation of the dimension of moduli space. If we cut along three geodesics, then we have three length parameters and three twist parameters. So we see that the dimension is 6 uh, over r. That's the Fenchel-Nielsen description, which, is, uh, which gives 6t minus 6 real dimensions. Uh, and of course, that's the same as 3g minus 3 complex dimensions. So these 
counts are at least compatible. Um, now, how do you picture a quadratic differential on a Riemann surface? Well, let's go back to the case of an elliptic curve. So one way to picture an elliptic curve together with a holomorphic one form is you take a parallelogram in the complex plane, and on this parallelogram, you have the one form dz. And now you glue opposite edges by translation. And, uh, and because the form is translation invariant, it descends to a holomorphic one form on the quotient. And so this picture gives rise to both an elliptic curve and a holomorphic one form. In other words, the choice of a lattice uniformizing X or a fundamental domain for that lattice is the same as the choice of a holomorphic one form on the quotient elliptic curve. Um, and the fact that for genus uh, one or more, the space of quadratic differentials is, uh, is positive dimensional says that you can draw similar pictures for Riemann surfaces of all genus. So this is, this is not as popularly known as it deserves to be. Let me call it a, 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 a sort of a uniformization theorem. So the theorem is that every X in MG can be presented as a quotient P modulo and equivalence relation. Give myself a little room here. P modulo and equivalence relation, where P is a polygon contained in the plane, and the gluing is by z goes to, let's say, plus or minus z plus a constant. So the edges are glued together by translations or possibly by negation. You might want to rotate an edge by 180 degrees. Um, so the, you know, the, the, the negative curvature hyperbolization theorem would say that for, this is for g greater than or equal to one, would say that for g greater than or equal to two, you can write x as a quotient of the hyperbolic plane, and it gets a negatively curved metric. This says you can write x as a quotient of a polygon in the flat plane by isometries, and so it gets a flat metric on it. So why don't we use this uniformization theorem instead of the usual one? So let me give you an example of this. So the simplest example, is you take a regular octagon in the plane. For our polygon P, and now you glue opposite edges. And lo and behold, you get a Riemann surface of genus J. And by the way, the vertices here are all identified to a single point in the quotient. And the edges are glued by translations. So we get a lot of structure on the quotient Riemann surface in this way. Um, so why don't we just use this, this theorem in place of the uniformization theorem? The reason is that this description of X as a polygon is far from being unique. And the reason for that is that when you write X as the quotient of a polygon in this way, you're giving more information than just the Riemann surface. Because, again, just as in the case of an elliptic curve, you can put a differential on this polygon. Let's make it a quadratic differential this time, dz squared. And now dz squared is invariant not just under translation, but also under z goes to minus z. So if our gluing constructions have this form, then p descends to give a quadratic differential on x. So when we describe x as the quotient of a polygon, what we get is not just x, but x plus a holomorphic quadratic differential. And so the real theorem is that every x and quadratic differential q in the space of pairs of quadratic differentials and, and 
Riemann surfaces, in other words, in the bundle over moduli space, whose fiber over x is q of x, can be presented as p dz squared in the plane modulo suitable gluing relations. Now, what's the difference between a, just a plain old Riemann surface and one that has a quadratic differential on it? What additional structure do you see down here on x? Well, one structure is you see a metric and an area form coming from the absolute value of q, which is locally just the absolute value of q of z times dz squared. And dz squared is just the good old Euclidean metric. So in other words, the Euclidean metric on p descends to give a flat metric on, uh, on um, x. But there's more, because this, uh, these transformations preserve the family of horizontal lines in the plane. The horizontal lines are preserved under translation and also under z goes to minus z. We don't orient the lines. And so down on x, we get a foliation. It's a foliation by geodesics with respect to this flat metric. And in fact, it's what's called a measured foliation because you can locally measure the distance between two parallel leaves. And indeed, we get even more than that because in addition to foliating in the horizontal direction, you could foliate in the vertical direction. And, uh, and so, the, so in fact, you get a pair of orthogonal foliations on your uh, rebound surface. Another way to say this is a quadratic differential gives you a way to make your Riemann surface out of tiny squares by gluing, gluing them together, the squares being bounded by the leaves in these uh, foliations. Now, one thing should seem a little bit wrong here. There is no way to comb a surface of genus not equal to one. There is no foliation of such a Riemann surface. There, only a torus carries a uh, non-singular foliation. And in fact, what happens is that these quadratic differentials have um, 4g minus 4 zeros. And at these zeros, the behavior of the foliation locally looks like, like this. It has three pronged singularities, the orthogonal foliation. Uh, coming in like this. That's what these foliations look like near a simple zero. So typically, this foliation on x will have 4g minus 4 singularities, each of which locally looks like this one here. In the case at hand, that's very far from what's happening. Um, what's happening is that all the singularities all come from this vertex here. So you get a single zero multiplicity four rather than four zeros of multiplicity one. And the foliation near, near the sing, unique singularity looks like this, but with six prongs instead of three. Okay, so there's a lot that can be said about quadratic differentials, but I just want to give you this, the idea of uh, this theory and now give its connection to SL2R. So we now have this space of enhanced Riemann surfaces, Riemann surfaces which can locally be described by polygons, that polygonal structure being recorded by this quadratic differential Q. And now comes the amazing idea, which is that SL2R acts on QMG. Now, in fact, this, this action is not completely unfamiliar because the space of quadratic differentials on, um, uh, and actually, let me make this just a little bit more precise. So when you have a quadratic differential, there's an invariant, which is the integral over x of the area form. That's called the norm of q. It's a canonical function 
on this um, on this bundle, and we can normalize so that the the area form is one, and so that's what I'll call Q sub one of mg, and SL2R acts on the space of unit area quadratic differentials. I'm going to define an action that obviously preserves the area because the fact that the determinant of SL2R is one. And the, 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 uh, the, the, um, the way it acts is very simple. If you take an element G in SL2R and you want to apply it to XQ, what you do is you present this as the quotient of a polygon in DZ squared by an equivalence relation. And then the polygon is sitting inside of C, which is isomorphic to R2. And so now you can just apply this element of SL2R to the polygon itself. You move or rotate or shear the polygon according to this transformation here. You get a new polygon. You take DC squared along for the ride and you form the quotient again. And the area of the form Q, its norm, is the same as the area of the polygon P, which is of course preserved by the action of SL2R. So this gives you a new Riemann surface uh, uh, it's called XG, uh, XG, Q, G. And that's the definition of the action of SL2R on the space of, um, on the space of unit norm quadratic differentials. Okay, now I said, I started to say this action should not be completely unfamiliar. And the reason is that the Teichmiller space of, well, let's say, let's talk about this space uh, uh, QM1, Q1M1. So the moduli space of Riemann surfaces of genus one is in fact a hyperbolic surface. It's SL2Z mod H, the quotient of the upper half plane by the action of the modular group and it turns out this space Q1 can be identified with the unit tangent bundle of moduli space, uh, which is, of course, gamma mod G, where gamma is SL2Z and G is SL2R. And so, of course, G acts here on the right, and that's the usual action of SL2R on the unit tangent bundle of any Riemann surface. So the case of genus one is already familiar to you. And the action is, for example, if you take this elliptic curve and you apply an element of N, like one T zero one to it, what happens is you get the curve that's uniformized by a new polygon, which is just obtained by shearing the polygon that you started with. If you apply the action of K, you actually don't change the elliptic curve, but you rotate the one form. So this is not entirely Unfamiliar, it just generalizes to surfaces of higher genes. Okay, so now what's the Teichmiller geodesic flow? So the Teichmiller geodesic flow is equal to the A action on Q1 of MG. In other words, it's the action that given a polygon, it contracts the, the height of the polygon and expands its width by the same factor to give you a new Riemann surface. So if you're given this equilateral octagon and you start applying the geodesic flow, you're set to octagons which look more like this. This should have the same area as the one I'm starting with, but it's been squished. The red foliation has gotten longer and the leaves of the blue foliation have gotten shorter. Okay. Now, what's not quite obvious, but is not too hard to imagine, is that there exists a natural finite measure on, um, on Q1 of Mg, which is invariant under this action of SL2R. 
And in fact, this measure can be described in a fairly simple way. One way of changing the loca your location in um, this moduli space of quadratic differentials is to change the lengths of the edges of this polygon and also rotate them slightly. And it turns out those linear coordinates uh, um, provide uh, a mapped Euclidean space. That's a local homeomorphism on the space of quadratic differentials. And then you just take the, the pullback of the Euclidean volume form, and it turns out to be natural and invariant under the action of SL2R. Um, OK, so, so the upshot is that in uh, for general Riemann surfaces, we have something that plays the role of the unit tangent bundle over moduli space. And it has not just a geodesic flow on it, but also a horocycle flow. And they mix together to give this action of SL2R. And then the claim is that that flow can be analyzed from the perspective of our Gothic theory, because it has a natural finite measure. And so we can ask, for example, if it's ergodic or not, if the geodesic flow is ergodic, if the horocycle flow is ergodic, et cetera. And so the next theorem is that, um, is that the geodesic flow on uh, Q1 MG is, mixed, is ergodic. In other words, the A action is ergodic. So let me sketch the proof of this theorem. It's actually very closely related to this business about foliations. Um, so here's, here's the idea of the proof. Um, okay, so we have our moduli space Mg. It's not compact, but finite volume. And here's some sort of geodesic gamma uh, in this typular um, setting. And what we do is we lift to the universal cover, which is Teichler space. And here, the, we, our Riemann surfaces X come equipped with a marking by some fixed topological surface, uh, which we'll call sigma G. And we can lift our geodesic to some sort of geodesic in uh, Teichler space. Now, associated to a given quadratic differential or to this geodesic, which is itself determined by a quadratic differential, is a pair of foliations. There's the horizontal foliation, I'll have to call that F minus, uh, F plus because it's being expanded, and the vertical foliation, which is being contracted. And as you move towards infinity in Teichler space, this blue foliation is squeezing down to nothing. So we can record the asymptotic behavior of this geodesic by recording the blue foliation. So what we do is we form on this surface, this topological surface, we form a space which records the possible shapes of the blue foliation. That is, it describes the topology of its leaves, nothing about their geometry. That's called the space of measured foliations of genus G. And then there's a transverse measure here, which would give you the lengths of these leaves, but we only know the lengths up to scale. So we take the rejective space of measured foliations. And then the forward endpoint of the geodesic is described by this, uh, this blue foliation F minus. And the backward endpoint is described by the expanding foliation F plus. And now what do you think you do? We just apply the hop argument. So we want to prove ergodicity of the geodesic flow. So we say, well, suppose we have a function that's invariant under the action of the geodesic flow. Then it, it gives us a function upstairs, which is invariant of, under the action of the geodesic flow. And then we show using ergodic theory that the value of this function doesn't depend on the we're endpoint of the geodesic because geodesics uh, 
that have a common terminal point are asymptotic to one another. But by the same token, it doesn't depend on the backward orbit, and therefore it doesn't depend on anything, and therefore it's constant. So the proof of this, of this theorem is by the Hopf argument plus using the idea that the boundary of Tychmuller space can be identified with the space of uh, measured foliations, which is a topological object. It's analogous to the light cone. Now, I should say that there was a lie here. And the lie is that it's not quite true that two geodesics with the same endpoint are always asymptotic to each other. Uh, but it turns out that they're almost always asymptotic. And that's enough to make the pop proof work. This whole question of whether or not they're asymptotic is wrapped up with the ergodic behavior of these foliations themselves. And it's a topic uh, of great interest in its own right, but one that we won't go into now. What I want to do now is just complete the proof of the theorem. So by the Hopf argument, by pretty soft argument, pretty easy argument, we get ergodicity. But how are we ever going to get mixing? Well, we proved a theorem that says if you have a unitary representation of SL2R, and if the action of A is ergodic, that means that if we go to L2 naught of Q1 of Mg, there are no A invariant vectors. So of course, there's no SL2R invariant vector. So the action of SL2R is ergodic, is, and therefore it's mixing by the how more theorem, and in particular, the A flow is mixing. So, so the, the proof of, um, the, so the, the corollary is that the uh, Teichmuller geodesic flow is mixing. And the proof is, it's just the special instance of this how more theorem, uh, A ergodic implies G ergodic implies G is mixing, which implies any subgroup is also mixing. And so as a bonus, we also get that the horror cycle flow is mixing uh, on the, over the moduli space of free bond surfaces. Okay, so that's an example of the power of this theorem, even for SL2R. When you have a, a flow and it extends to an action of SL2R, then once you've proved the flow is ergodic, it's automatically mixing. Okay. Um, so let me just, uh, what I'm going to do uh, next time is, uh, is sketch the proof of, um, of the how more theorem. So we're going to, next time, we'll sketch the proof of how more, not for our, all semi-simple groups, but for the typical case of SLAR. And um, to deal with SLNR, we're going to use uh, two nice tricks. One is that within SLNR, we have the following matrices. You put the identity of rank n minus one in the upper left-hand corner, you put the identity of rank one in the lower left-hand corner, and then you put a vector v1 up to vn minus one here. So these matrices form a group. Let's call that P. And this group is just isomorphic to the additive group Rn minus one. Now we also have within the, the group SLNR, we also have the, the usual diagonal matrices. So these are have entries A1 up to AN, zero here, and of course the product A1, A2 up to AN should be equal to one. And what we need to get the proof going is something like the double coset theorem that we proved earlier. And the theorem, uh, the engine that gets us started is that for any unitary representation of now G is SLNR, 
any vector invariant under P A or G is invariant under all three. So that's, that's similar to the double coset theory that we proved for SL2R. And then we'll need to further exploit the general theory of SL2R, both in the proof of this theorem and in the proof of the general theorem. And the way we do that is that we observe that if we think of SL and R as acting on Rn, then inside of this, we have many copies of R2, because we can take Rei plus Rtn the ith and nth coordinate, and that gives a copy of gi sitting inside of SLNR, where gi looks like SL2R. So these are the two main ideas in the proof. One is that there's analogs of A and N, which we call A and P. The other is that there's many copies of SL2, and we'll combine those ideas to leverage what we already know for SL2, and extend the argument for SLA. Um, okay, so we'll do that next time, and then we'll move uh, we'll move back to some more geometric applications of ergodic theory and towards the uh, statement of uh, Radner's theory. Okay. <laughs>